All right, this is called, down at the bottom here, the eternal law of progression. In older Mormonism, that would have been the law of eternal progression. Uh, there are, have been some changes and developments over time. Does anyone else want the PDF? Yes, sir. Um, so, right now, we'll just go with the eternal law of progression. The change over time, basically, the early Mormon formulation of these things was that you could never progress farther than your ancestors in the law of progression. This was the great motivation to get your family baptized for the dead, get them uh, their endowments taken care of so they could become gods, so you could become gods. That part has sort of fallen out of modern, the modern uh, Mormon view on this matter. But this is supposed to be a circle. But you've got to jump into a circle someplace. So we will jump into the circle up here. And right here, you'll notice we've got spirit children here and spirit children here. That's where it connects up. That's where the circle sort of closes. Um, so we'll, we'll start up here in this section. And we'll blow it up for you here. Yes, sir. Yeah, I've noticed the way you take notes, brother. Do you, brother, do you realize that your notes are rather jumbled and go different directions? Just thought I'd mention that. It's not a very Reformed Baptist thing, but it's okay. Lines, do they connect up? Because it's like the... Dotted line. If you go back to the, the full diagram... Have like a circle of lines connected all? No, no. Uh, uh, you'll you'll see that that conceptually, spirit children here and spirit children there is where it all connects up. All right. The first box has intelligences and matter. These are the two eternal things in Mormonism. You will notice that God is not in that box, because God has not eternally been God. Um, intelligences and matter. Now, I've met some Mormons that actually uh, dispute the idea of intelligences being eternal, but most do not. Um, what is an intelligence? I guess the best I, explanation I could was is the essence of the mind or something along those lines. Um, it's not a spirit because that comes later. So it's, it's sort of the essence of the mind. And... Mormon leaders will talk about uh, the intelligences eternally existing, and each one of us existed as an intelligence along with God and all the other gods, all uh, as intelligences in the primeval past. But then you will notice that matter is eternal in Mormonism. Matter is eternal. There is no creatio ex nihilo. There is no creation out of or into nothing in uh, Mormon theology, and I can guarantee you before this night is over, I'm going to say Muslim theology instead of Mormon theology. Just forgive me ahead of time, it's going to happen. Uh, but I'm only talking about Mormonism tonight, so if I say that, just ignore it and move on from there. Uh, there is no creator God. Um, if matter is eternal, then God has been derived from that matter. And even in LDS theology, Spirits are made of matter. As Joseph Smith said, a more refined matter, refined in such a way that it is not visible to the physical eye. And so matter is eternal and is not a created thing. What God can do is organize matter. Uh, organize it into different shapes, different functions, so on and so forth. But he cannot, God cannot say, let there be, and there is. What God can do is organize pre-existing matter. That is part of the power uh, that comes with exaltation to deity. Now, you'll see the red line going from intelligence to matter, to, uh, matter to spirit children. One of the problems in doing it like this um, is that you, uh, you have to dive into the circle somewhere we will see where spirit children come from at the end of this. For now, I just have to tell you spirit children 
are the offspring of celestial parents. The celestial parents are on the other side of the diagram. We'll get to where they come from, but you got to jump into the circle someplace. Uh, we do have a question from the online students. Were there Eastern influences on Joseph Smith? The eternality of intelligence sounds like a very Hindu Buddhist concept. Um, while there are similar languages, similar language and similar concepts, I am unaware of any um, Eastern influences on Joseph Smith whatsoever. I mean, he went through, what, eighth grade? I think, I think it was eighth grade was Max. Uh, he may have had some access uh, through a family member to some commentaries on the Bible on certain things, but certainly nothing much in, that would have introduced him to concepts of Hinduism or Buddhism. So uh, the, the connection there is um, uh, not genealogical, shall we say. Now, spirit children are born, born to celestial parents. And spirit children grow, they learn, they are of differing levels of intelligence, differing levels of fealty and uh, faithfulness as far as their relationship to their heavenly father is concerned. Um, God is not uh, a monogamist, so there are many heavenly mothers um, I don't think they've removed it. The last time I checked from the LDS hymnal, uh, still had the, um, the hymn in it that talked about our heavenly mothers. Uh, it makes reason stare. Uh, truth eternal, truth divine tells us I have a mother there, something along those lines. Um, and uh, so the, uh, you won't hear this so much in talking with non-Mormons, and maybe not so much today, I don't know, but... Uh, certainly, many decades ago, there would be much more discussion, much, there was much more speculation amongst Mormons about uh, pre-earthly relationships. For example, if you'd have, uh, I've had ex-Mormons tell me about how uh, if you had two Mormons that were very, very close to one another, say two women who weren't uh, physical sisters, but they were just very, very close, they would speculate, I bet we had the same spiritual mother. You know, there there was a sisterhood that was that was that was there because they had the same spirit mother in the preexistence. But the idea is that there is birth, there is growth, there is education uh, as a spirit child, and so obviously, and, and we'll make application of all this to this planet. But obviously, for us, that would mean that Mormons believe that we existed in a spirit realm as spirit children of our heavenly Father before we came here to this earth. Um, that memory is removed from us. Most Mormons tell me so that we can be properly tested to see if we'll be faithful to return back into the presence of Heavenly Father. Uh, uh, Granny Gear, Thelma Gear, uh, talks about old Mormon legends amongst the Mormon women back in Utah, uh, that it was the shock of taking a six-foot-tall spirit child and cramming it into a little baby that caused the memory loss, uh, which... I suppose would be somewhat of a shocking thing. So uh, uh, maybe maybe that's the explanation. I don't know, but uh, uh, we don't have a recollection of this. Now you will notice there are two lines that lead from the spirit children realm: a large, thick red line and a much narrower line here. We will define that much narrower line. Uh, I'll just tell you for now. You can see it here in the large right here. Uh, you can't see it real well, but that's Satan and the demons. We'll get to where Satan and the demons came from, but notice they go from the spirit realm. They do not go through the mortal realm. That line bypasses that and goes straight down here to hell without crossing this green line of resurrection either. We'll get to the reason for that as we move along. So from the spirit realm, we go to this section now. From the spirit realm, uh, we enter into the period of mortal probation, which is where we are right now. Uh, physical existence upon uh, a planet. Uh, for us, it would be Earth, but from the Mormon perspective, there have literally been an unlimited number of planets like this on which human beings have lived and died, uh, where there have been savior figures and God figures. And if you sort of think this through in your mind, if even a small portion of the faithful Mormon men 
over the past 140 years uh, since, uh, uh, well, no, you, you've got 170, 180 years now, 180 years. Uh, April 6, 1830 was the founding of the LDS Church. We would just want to take that as the sort of the date. Um, over the past 180 years uh, of history, if even a small portion of those men become gods as Mormonism promises they become gods, that means they, are, they die, they're resurrected, they take their wives, plural, with them, because they can be, they, at least when Joseph Smith and Brigham Young were around, could be sealed to many wives. Uh, and even in modern LDS theology, after death they can be. Uh, take their wives, they organize a planet, didn't create the planet, they have to organize the pre-existing matter, and they start the process all over again, except now that Mormon man will be the god of his own planet, and his offspring will then inhabit that planet and start the whole thing all over again. So that would mean, logically, that you would have a, a very rapidly increasing number of gods. Because if this is happening on literally billions and billions of planets, the number of gods is increasing exponentially. That's why I said I cannot think of a more polytheistic system uh, than Mormonism is. And so uh, you can sort of see how all of this works. So from the spirit realm, uh, these children go down into the mortal probation. Uh, most Mormons will tell you that this is where we are tested to see whether we are faithful to, re- to return back into the presence of our Heavenly Father. Um, out of that mortal probation, you see two lines. One is a purple line going up to paradise that's marked with an A and a B. And then you have an orange line uh, that goes down from mortal probation. Now let's talk about what the A and the B are first. The A is the four fundamentals of the gospel. The four fundamentals of the gospel. The four fundamentals of the gospel that pretty much any Mormon kid can tell you are faith, repentance, baptism, and laying out of hands to receive the Holy Ghost. Okay? Now, again, here we have the problem of language. Faith and repentance. Well, that must be pretty much the same thing we believe. Well, similarities. But once you start with a polytheistic system, there's a lot of differences too. Uh, faith in who? Faith in what? Uh, what is saving faith, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. There really isn't a discussion of saving faith. Uh, and this faith would include the acceptance of uh, the claims of Joseph Smith to prophethood and the issues relating to the uh, restoration of the church, the, the priesthood, and, and things like that. Repentance, yeah, it is repentance from sin, but there really isn't a meaningful doctrine of sin that, it, that correlates to our own in Mormonism. Um, yeah, breaking of God's law, there, there's a lot of guilt and, and, and worthiness issues amongst Mormons. There's no question about that. But there's, there's so many differences in, I mean, once, once you no longer have a, a creator God, and once we are of the same species as God, um, think about it. If God the Father of this world was once a man lived on the planet like a Mormon, you know, Mormon missionary that I might be talking to. I say, do you feel that you could become a God? Well, I hope to be found worthy to become a God. Are you a sinner? Yes. So when you become the God of your world, the God of that world will have once been a sinner, right? Yes. Now I've had some Mormons say, well, we don't know if God, the father of our world was once a sinner. He might've been the savior figure of his world. Like Jesus was sinless. But the reality is the vast majority of gods in the cosmos would not have been savior figures. They would have been regular people who lived on earth, died, resurrected, and become a god. And so when your god was once redeemed, that has a huge impact on your doctrine of sin. Now what's more is Mormons believe that Adam 
did not fall, he transgressed. But it was purposeful. In other words, before Adam came into the garden, and I'm going to lay off to the side right now the whole dispute, and it really isn't a dispute, there is no question that Brigham Young developed a doctrine called the Adam-God doctrine. Brigham Young taught Adam was our God. There's no question about it. You can just read it throughout his writings. Uh, people like Eldon Watson and others have done their best to try to get around it, but it's, it's, just, it's as plain as the nose on your face. So Brigham Young came up with that. That's now considered a heresy today. But leaving that off to the side, the average Mormon with whom you're going to speak uh, believes, if they're fairly well read, um, that Adam, as he pre-existed, was one of the preeminent sons of God. And it was decided that when he entered into flesh, he was going to transgress He would have to because he would be put in a position where he had two conflicting commands. The one command was do not eat of the fruit of the tree. The other was be fruitful and multiply. He would choose the better of the two because once Eve partook, she became mortal. Now they cannot be fruitful and multiply unless what happens? Adam becomes mortal. The only way for Adam to become mortal is to partake of the fruit and transgress. And therefore, Adam actually made the right choice. He did the right thing in transgressing. He didn't fall. He transgressed. Now, when you view sin like that, and you have a God who is redeemed from another planet, you don't have a foundation to even begin to understand what's going on in Isaiah 6. Holy, 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 and the... You don't, you have no basis for understanding the wrath of God and, and God's detestation of sin and the purity of God, the transcendence of God. That's why I said Muslims have more in common uh, with Christians and their view of God than the Mormons do. Because you just, foundationally, it is just so radically different. So radically different. And so even repentance, because the doctrine of sin is so different, cannot be made a a direct parallel but then you look at baptism and at least for us uh there's no question about the fact uh that they do believe in baptism by immersion i uh uh, had the opportunity finally i forget how long ago it was now uh to tour an lds temple i had never had the opportunity have you ever been through one of the temple openings well, you're in a temple as a Mormon, but okay. So that's even better than going through the, uh, through the opening, I suppose. So uh, we've got a brother up here who knows the, the temple ceremonies, and we could probably do the five points. Of, we won't do the five points of fellowship, but uh, uh, show you some of the, uh, the endowment stuff a little bit later on maybe. But um, I, I finally, after years and years of studying Mormonism, had the opportunity of going through a temple. It was the, uh, um, uh, the Manhattan Temple which was one of only two temples in the world that is not a freestanding building. The other one is, I think, in Tokyo, if I recall correctly, or Hong Kong. It's in one of those cities where trying to find land to build a a freestanding building is next to impossible. And so in Manhattan, they actually built it in a pre-existing building, but on different levels uh, from one another. Now, if you're familiar with, what's the one temple that you've all seen? The Salt Lake Temple. That's the, the big mama of them all. That's, I mean, if you get married in the Salt Lake Temple, you're special. There's no question about it. You've got you to pull some strings uh, to get into that one. Um, if you recall it, it, it's built on different levels. And, and up until, I believe it was the Atlanta Temple, finally broke this mold. But all the temples before that, the, you would basically progress upwards. And the, the baptismal font... Uh, in all the older temples, was always below ground. And it is built on the back of the statues of 12 oxen so that it parallels the um, uh, uh, material of the temple in the Old Testament, the laver that was on the back of 12 oxen in uh, Solomon's temple. And uh, uh, I remember seeing that, and I remember seeing the, uh, the network connections 
because now it's all become computerized. Was it computerized in your day, or did you use the, use the temple rec- you know, the, the card stuff and things like that? Oh, you had the overhead projector type thing. Now it's all on computer and digitized and all the rest of that stuff. And um, so uh, you, I was asking the guy, the, our guide afterwards, you know, I was asking him, well, I saw these. He was amazed at how much I knew as, as a non-Mormon having never gone through it about sort of what was hidden away in the, uh, in the temple thing. We'll, we'll get into the temple stuff a little, bit, a little bit later on. But baptism is by immersion in this baptistry that's built on the, you know, uh, back of 12 oxen, but, 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 you might say, well, and I've been baptized that way. Yeah, but your baptism isn't valid. And why isn't your baptism valid? Because you have to have the priesthood to perform baptism. What priesthood? Well, minimally, minimally you have to have the Aaronic priesthood. Now, normally it's a Melchizedek priest that does the baptism. But Joseph Smith thought the power of baptism is in the Aaronic priesthood and laying out of hands in the Melchizedek priesthood. But normally the guy who does it has both. Now, where did that priesthood come from? Well, according to Joseph Smith, later on anyways, uh, jo- uh, uh, John the Baptist uh, came back and in 1829, gave the Aaronic priesthood to Joseph Smith. And then Peter, James, and John came back and gave the Melchizedek priesthood to Joseph Smith and reestablished the priesthood on the earth. The church cannot exist without the priesthood. The priesthood existed in the early church, but then the early church went into apostasy. The priesthood was lost, and hence the Christian church ceased to exist for about 1,800 years. Not quite 1,800 years, but around there. And so both the last two of A here, the four fundamentals, require the restored LDS priesthood. Both of those, you, you can lay, on your hands all you, lay your hands on somebody all you want. Um, that's, that, that doesn't matter. You have to have the Melchizedek priesthood to lay hands upon someone to receive the Holy Spirit. And so when you do endowments for the dead, for example, when you do baptism and laying out of hands, um, did you do baptism for the dead? How many were you baptized for in one session? If I remember, I think like eight to twelve. Eight to twelve. Okay. Uh, I think you can do up to fifty if you've really been doing your genealogy work really well. But you go through the baptism, and then you leave the baptistry and normally go into a separate room, and there are elders there in their full temple regalia. And you bow, you're on your knees, I, I believe, and they lay their hands upon you, and they will say, uh, we lay our hands upon you in the name of, and they have, a, again, a, a list, the same people you were just baptized for. They go through the names, and they will lay their hands upon you in the name of such and such a person, and they lift their hands up, and then they put their hands back down for the next person, and they go through that whole list, the same list of people you were baptized for. So both of those activities, you can do that for the dead, but you also have it done for yourself, obviously, initially, are done under the power of the priesthood. And so even in the four fundamentals of the faith, we have fundamental differences in faith, repentance because of the doctrine of sin, and then baptism and laying out of hands has to be in the, in the LDS priesthood. Uh, we wrote a tract years ago called By What Authority? Because Mormons would frequently say us, by what authority do you do these things? Because let's face it, how many evangelicals when a Mormon walks up to you and starts talking about priesthood are going to have any idea what in the world to say? And yet there's all sorts of stuff in the Bible about the priesthood. I mean, the, the Mormon priesthood is so far removed from any biblical concept that it's, that it's ridiculous. And so one of our most popular tracks, especially amongst the young Mormon elders, up there in Salt Lake City was our track on the priesthood uh, because they were really challenged by it. It's like, I'm not sure how to answer that. You, know? uh, you might want to think about that before you claim to be a priest. So you have A, then, the four fundamentals of the gospel, absolutely minimum, cannot be negotiated. You have to have those four to get into paradise and into the celestial level of glory. It has to happen. But that's not enough. That's just the bottom floor. That's the minimum daily requirement of vitamin C. You know, okay, it's just got to have it. Then we have a B there, and that is continued obedience to gospel rules and principles. And what might that be? 
Well, it sort of depends on which Mormon you talk to, but uh, it is, in essence, the living of a worthy life. Um, the following of the specific uh, guidance of the, the general authorities of the church, living in such a way that is, that is uh, considered to be uh, the worthy, necessary ways. It it's works righteousness is what it is. I mean, you read it. Remember, remember the introduction just a few hours ago uh, that we went through in regards to uh, celestial marriage and, and all the other things that are added in. Um, and it is that B that will determine where you end up in the celestial kingdom because the celestial kingdom itself has different gradations and levels. Uh, you can be in the celestial kingdom, but on the lower end of the celestial kingdom if you do not do everything that you're supposed to do to... Uh, uh, prove your worthiness to uh, enter into paradise and into the celestial kingdom. Okay? So, let's look back at where we are now in our, our section. Let's, let's, instead of going upwards, let's uh, go down here to this section of the, uh, this section right here. Because the line that went up to paradise, the small purple line, is pretty thin. Today, there are 13 to 14 million uh, Mormons in the world. That's a pretty small percentage in comparison to the over 6 billion people on the planet. The larger line comes out of the mortal probation and goes down to the spirit prison. The spirit prison. Now, what is the spirit prison? Well, generally, uh, Mormons will uh, make reference to uh, the spirit prison referenced in uh, Second Peter. Um, the spirit prison is where all non-Mormons go uh, who did not have the four fundamentals of the gospel, those four things that need to have happened to get up on that purple line, uh, end up in the spirit prison. So that might mean moral uh, Christian believers and uh, Muslims and Buddhists and Atheists, everybody, end, everybody ends up in the spirit prison. Yes, sir? Mormons or? Um, the only Mormons that end up in, this, in the spirit prison, if they've gone through those four, if, if, now, if they've not gone through the four fundamentals, sure, yeah. I mean, the, the quote-unquote Jack Mormon uh, that's Mormon in name only, yeah, sure. But you'll notice... Uh, if you look carefully at the PDF, and I'll show it to you here in a moment, you can see the bottom part of the, of the arrow right here. There is one little thin line that comes down from the purple line into that, and we'll talk about that later, but those are the apostate Mormons. Those are the Mormons who, depending on what period in history you lived in, in the days of Brigham Young, that was a bigger line, <laughs> Uh, when you had the doctrine of blood atonement and stuff like that, and Brigham Young was trying to keep control of the church. Uh, today, most Mormons would tell me uh, that you have to have had a testimony of the Holy Spirit, that Mormonism was true, and deny that to become one of the sons of perdition, uh, the apostate Mormons who end up in the spirit prison and, in fact, then end up in hell. Um, and we'll explain how that works a little bit later on. That you'd have to have had a testimony of the Holy Spirit that was true. I don't think Brigham Young would have said that, but that's, that's another, another issue. Yeah, That's you? So you, you were supposed to have had a, a testimony of the Holy Spirit, huh? Uh, all right, so we have a son of perdition with us. If you'd like to go up and get his uh, autograph later on, uh, I'm sure he would be uh, happy to do so. Uh, it will smoke after he writes uh, it for you, but uh, anyway. Uh, now, so... The spirit prison, well, here you are, you can't get out of this place. And there's all sorts of people here. And then all of a sudden, you got to give the Mormons one thing. you got to give the Mormons one thing. They are a missionary people. They are a missionary people. Because what happens is, some who have already died and gone up into paradise, come down into the spirit prison and preach the Mormon gospel. So even when you're dead, you can't stop going on missions if you're a Mormon. Uh, there are dead Mormon missionaries that come down to the spirit prison and preach how you can get out. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was in a spirit prison I couldn't get out of, 
and someone came along and said, this is how you get out, and then you can see that they can leave, I think that would be a fairly decent incentive to believe what they had to say. But not a large portion of people take him up on the offer. Uh, as is seen by the big blue line coming out of spirit prison and entering into after resurrection, the two lower levels of glory, the terrestrial and celestial levels of glory. But remember, let's say you want out of spirit prison. Let's say, oh, I, I never heard the message and now uh, the good Mormon missionaries have come and uh, I don't think they have spiritual bikes for the spirit prison, do they? I don't, I've never heard about that, but sort of, sort of fit, you know, but... Uh, uh, they come and preach the gospel to you, and you decide you want to get out. Now, think about it for a second. What's the absolute minimum thing you've got to have? The four fundamentals of the gospel. Now, a spirit can believe. A spirit can repent. But have you ever tried to baptize a spirit by immersion? Not very easy. Not very easy at all. So that's why we have the little green line that goes up to baptism for the dead. Baptism for the dead. Derived allegedly out of 1 Corinthians 15, 29, which does make reference to baptism for the dead. Uh, But in the Mormon concept, what you have going on here is living people uh, being baptized for those who have died in proxy baptism. And so if you were to go out to the temple in Mesa, what's the closest temple to here? Do you know? No, to here. Um, actually, the one outside of Louisville is Crestwood. Okay, Crestwood, Kentucky. So if you went over to Crestwood, Kentucky, and you parked your car across the street and then just watched on most weeknights, uh, not Monday night, but on, on most weeknights, say a Thursday night, something like that, you would see people driving in, and they would park their cars, and they would get out, and they'd have a satchel-type thing with them. And you'd see them walking into the temple, and a couple hours later, you'd see them walking out of the temple. Well, what have they been doing? Well, you probably know, if you've ever tried to do any genealogical research, like get on Ancestry.com or something like that, have you noticed the Mormons own all that stuff? The Mormons bought everybody else's genealogical libraries a long time ago and put them all together. And the impetus for that goes back to the concept of eternal progression, back to the concept of getting your, your, your relatives on the track here. Like I said, a lot of that has fallen out of the, of the modern emphasis, but there is still this concept of, uh, in their minds of being the saviors of the dead. I want my ancestors to have the ability to enter into exaltation, to enter into the presence of God. And so they see themselves as saviors of the dead, and especially in Utah and places like that, um, contact with the dead was not an unusual thing to talk about when you talk with Mormons. And I've talked with Mormons who've talked about having contact with the dead. Um, I'll be really interested. Have you heard me talk about this before? Good, good. Because I'll be interested, I want to ask you a question after I tell you this story. Um, because this is sort of an of a experiment for a second. Um, Michael Beliveau and I, Michael, Mike, Mike and Linda Beliveau, co-founded Alpha Omega Ministries with me and my wife, Kelly. Uh, Michael Beliveau uh, and I went on a visit to a Mormon uh, home, actually an apartment, uh, right across from Grand Canyon College a number of years ago. And as we sat in the front room talking with a middle-aged woman about the faith, there was a stairway along the wall that went up, obviously, to the second level of the home. And you know how you can sort of like see shadows moving a little bit? Not not a real strong shadow, but you you hear noises once in a while. You get a feeling somebody's around a corner, but you're just not completely sure. I just had a feeling somebody was listening. Well, I was right, because as we sort of started wrapping things up and it was very clear that the person we were talking to really didn't have a a lot of answers, all of a sudden, a young girl came down the stairs and sat on the stairs and said, I'd like to say something to you. I've been listening to this conversation. 
Well, I knew she had been up there, but I've been listening to this conversation, she said. And I want to tell you about what happened to me when I was baptized for the dead in the temple. She said, when I went into the baptistry with the elder, because uh, there's normally two elders involved, one who's doing the baptism and one who's called the recorder. He's the one that makes sure the names aren't skipped or something like that. And she said, as she went down into the baptistry and she was baptized for the first time, as she came out of the water, up along the top of the wall in front of her, she saw a line of spirit beings who were looking at her. And as she came out of the water that first time, one at one end smiles and disappears. So she's put under the water the second time, and she comes up. And the next one in line smiles and disappears. So she's baptized as many times as she was supposed to be. She had done her genealogical work. You, you bring the names in. That's how they put them on the, on the list and, and so on and so forth. And she comes up out of the water the last time. There are two spirit beings. One smiles and leaves and one begins to cry. Now, it's just as quiet in that room when she's telling me this as it is in here right now. And she says, I was so troubled that I said to the elders, we've missed someone. Check the list. And when we went back and checked the list, we had skipped a name. And so I was baptized in the name of that person. And as I came out of the water, the spirit that had been crying smiled and disappeared. And she said, I don't care what Bible verses you show me. I saw that, and that proves Mormonism is true. Now, have you ever heard that story or some, something similar to it? It sounds very familiar with that kind of... Yeah. The reason I ask is that someone else later told me a very similar story. So I have to wonder if it's the, when the Christians are asking you questions you can't answer, throw this one at them and see what happens type thing. But I didn't get that feeling that night. I did not get the feeling she was just, oh, I'm going to throw something out there. Uh, She was very adamant about what she said. Now, I leave it to you how you would answer something like that. It was quite the experience. It certainly tests your dedication to the finality of the word of God and how you can bring that to bear in someone's life. Uh, but uh, that's, that's something to be mentioned. By the way, I just happened to notice a question in, uh, online. Is it true that LDS folks wear a special type of undergarment for spiritual reasons? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, Mormons wear their temple garments. The temple garments have changed over the years. Um, the... LDS temple ceremonies were deeply influenced uh, by Joseph Smith's involvement in masonry. Uh, In fact, there are many people who feel that the people who killed Joseph Smith in the Carthage jail were masons because he had revealed the secrets of their temple ceremonies. It is true that as he went out the door, out the window, uh, as they were shooting at him, uh, he was giving the Masonic distress signal, so that would seem to indicate that... uh, There was something to do with that. Who knows? There's all sorts of different stories. But um, the the point is that I once had an ex-Mormon in in a class I was giving on Mormonism, and we went through the various handshakes. Um, Would would you mind if we... Okay, all right. Um, uh, Do you know what the sure sign of the nail is? Okay. There are, there are handshakes that you, that you do, and um, I went through these with this former Temple Mormon, and after the, pro, the uh, class was over, a uh, guy came up, and he pulled his thing up, and he showed me his watch. It was a Masonic watch with all the symbols around the 32nd degree Mason, and he said, there were levels of our temple you could have gone through with what you just did. I was like, 
really might tell you something about what you're doing. Uh, but anyway, uh, it, it was it was very very uh, interesting. Uh, but that's all that's all involved uh, with baptism for the dead and the idea that they have that they are in essence saviors of the dead uh, through this uh, through this mechanism. And so. I would think they'd be running out of folks to be baptized for by now, to be perfectly honest with you. They've been doing it so long. Uh, and records only go back so far. I mean, there are certain cultures that this is totally irrelevant in. There's no way you could ever do the type of documentation to be able to do this kind of baptism. And Mormons believe that during the millennium, the temples will be operating and doing baptism for the dead so that everybody in the spirit prison will have the opportunity, if they want to get out, the last two elements of the four fundamentals will have been done for them. And yet, a large portion of those people will not. So what will happen is at the day of resurrection, right here, that's the green line here, at the day of resurrection, they will be judged on their works. And they will go to one of three levels of glory. So let's look at what the three levels of glory are here. Here you have them, celestial, terrestrial, and telestial. Now, if you were to stand at the side of the um, temple in Salt Lake City and look at it, have you been to Temple Square? Yeah. You will see three rows of stones. The upper row at the top are various uh, phases of the sun. In the middle is the moon, and the bottom is stars. These are the three levels. Joseph Smith derived these three levels of heaven from Acts, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where he talks about the three levels of glory. There's a glory of the sun, there's a glory of the moon, there's a glory of the stars. And there it is in stone on the side of the Salt Lake Temple in the Salt Lake City. But then... After Paul says that, he then says, and there is a glory celestial and a glory terrestrial. Now, here's where, you know, if, if, you, if you ever really want to, one of the first books I would suggest you read, if you're going to be doing um, ministry amongst Mormons, is a I think it's still blue covered book, hardback from Deseret, I think, or called Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith by Joseph Fielding Smith. Now, why is that so useful? Because it's in chronological order. And so you can see the development and evolution in Smith's thought from beginning to end. It's really useful. That is also where you will find the King Follett Funeral Discourse, which if you read anything, on the Mormon doctrine of God, you will see in Is the Mormon My Brother, I have major sections of the King Follett Funeral Discourse because it is the single most commonly cited sermon of Joseph Smith by Mormon leaders for the past 150 years. So it's not like, oh, we're going to pick on this. No, the Mormons uh, have used it. it. It really laid out his final, right before his death, this is only a matter of weeks before his death, uh, final view of, of God, which was not the view that he had when he wrote the Book of Mormon, by the way. You will not find any of this stuff in the Book of Mormon. You can read the Book of Mormon until the cows come home, and you're not going to run into space gods from Kolob. Um, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention to you. I didn't give you the, the, the coolest parallel with Battlestar Galactica. The, the planet they're looking for is Kobol. According to the Book of Abraham... In the Pearl of Great Price, God, God the Father of this planet, lives on a planet that circles a star named Kolob, K-O-L-O-B. They just switched the two letters. So that's the star that is the, the sun for the planet on which God lives, is Kolob. So Kobol, Kolob, I forgot to mention that. I'm sorry. Uh, you remembered that, but I, I, I forgot to mention that. Uh, I was so intent on Adama and uh, Alpo food and stuff like that. So anyway, um, so now that, that got me all, all, all messed up here. So you, Joseph Smith sees 
that you have sun, moon, stars, three levels of glory. But then Paul says there's a celestial glory and a terrestrial glory. Now, Joseph Smith did not understand the Bible very well. Okay? And some of his exegesis, that's, why, that's how I got to Joseph Fielding Smith's book. It's just amazing. Just absolutely. That some of the comments he makes in that book, well, if it weren't for the spiritual damage that is done, would make you chuckle. They really would. What he does is he, obviously he had no idea that the King James has a little bit of an editing problem. Now, a little history here. The King James was translated by scholars at various locations. And back then, it was very difficult for them to do the type of editing that we can do today once you put the final product, product together. So, for example, in Matthew and Romans, the command, thou shalt not murder, is found in both Matthew and Romans in the exact same Greek words. But the King James translates it once as thou shalt not kill and once as thou shalt not murder. They didn't even it out because it was translated by two different groups. They just chose different words. And instead of it being evened out in the editing process, it just didn't. Here's another example. Celestial and terrestrial are the very same Greek words that are translated by the King James in John chapter 3 as heavenly and earthly. That's all they mean are heavenly and earthly. But Joseph Smith didn't understand that. So he sees celestial and terrestrial, and he says, well, there's supposed to be three levels of glory. Well, something must have gotten lost, because he came up with his own version of the Bible, too, by the way, where he, for example, recovered the entire chapter in Genesis that happened to be a prophecy about a coming prophet named Joseph. Um, So uh, when you're a prophet, you can do things like that, see? And so uh, he reasons that something's missing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And so you see that that bottom word? Have you ever heard of the word telestial? No, you've not heard of the word of telestial because Joseph Smith made it up. He took the first two letters of terrestrial and slapped it on the end of celestial, and you've got telestial. And there's your third level of glory. That's the glory of the stars. Microsoft Word obviously was not uh, made in, uh, in Utah, yeah, uh, or it would not have been underlined. Uh, so, yes, there is the celestial level of glory. Now, I've been told by some nice Mormons that because I'm a moral man and, uh, you know, I've been faithful to my wife and tried to raise my kids well and uh, I don't kick the dog and throw the cat out the window and stuff like that, Um, that I will make it into the terrestrial level of glory. That's a pretty nice Mormon to say that. Um, Other Mormons were not so certain about that. Uh, The first time we ever passed out tracks in Salt Lake City, Mike Beliveau and I were up there in May. May of 19... It's 83 or 84. I think it was 84. Uh, I have it written down someplace. And it was a warm day in May. In Salt Lake, and so we were passing out tracks, and I decided I was going to go over to the Howard Johnson and get something to drink because we didn't have any water bottles with us or anything. And so I'm walking across uh, North Temple and West Temple, and I had caught up with an elderly Mormon man who has left the temple, and he's got his he's got his bag with him. You know, he, so he's just he's just left the temple from being baptized to the dead. Okay. So he's walking across, and I decide, well, I've got my tracks with me. And so as, we're, as I catch up to him, I say, uh, can I share something with you, sir? He looks at it, and he knew who I was. He had, he had walked past me out of the door. He goes, go to hell. And I looked at him and said, sir, according to your theology, I can't. And he was so frustrated because he knew I was right. Because, you see, I'm not a former Mormon. I'll... What he should have said was, go to the celestial kingdom, because at least then it would have worked. But you see, I, I can't get down here, because I'm not one of the apostate Mormons. I've never been a member of the Mormon church, never received a testimony, anything else. I, I, I said, sir, I, I can't go there, according to your own theology. And he knew I was right, and so he was very unhappy about that. But he did not take the tract either, so 
Uh, it was a uh, lose-lose situation there. Let's look at the top right corner here. Uh, oh, by the way, um, yeah, I think I'll go back to it. I'll, I'll mention it there. Let's go, let's go at the top and then go down to the bottom from there. When a Mormon dies, he goes into paradise. And from paradise, those missionaries are sent down to the spirit prison. When a person in the spirit prison repents and believes and someone back on earth is baptized for them, then they can be released from the spirit prison and go into paradise. That means there might be people, and this is one of the motivations for really working hard on your genealogies, there might be people in the spirit prison that have repented and believed, but they can't get out yet because there's no one who's done the proxy baptism for them yet. So you want to make sure that you do due diligence in doing your genealogy work so that you can make sure that those people have the opportunity of getting out if they want to, see. I mean, it, it's sort of a pressure that's placed upon you. So you go to paradise. So then at resurrection, and resurrection, very, very important. Did you notice? Let me, let me back up here a second. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Uh, back up here a second so we can see this. Notice that uh, the people who go into the terrestrial and celestial levels of glory are resurrected individuals. They've crossed that green line. That means they receive their physical body back, but in a slightly altered state. Because those in the celestial and terrestrial levels of glory cannot have children. One of the powers of God, the two Things that mark God off. The power of the priesthood, and the power of procreation. The power of the priesthood and the power of procreation. The people in the terrestrial and celestial levels cannot have increase of seed for eternity. Okay? But the people who go up to the celestial level, that's different. They receive their bodies back, and those who have been married for time and eternity in the celestial marriage ceremony, have the ability to have children, they receive exaltation as gods, they start the process all over again, and that's where the spirit children come from that was over on the other side of the diagram. Okay? However, there are levels even in the celestial kingdom. <laughs> I, uh, I got this wild idea back in the early 1980s while I was teaching a class on... Uh, on uh, Mormonism, I said, you know what? Why don't we pick a Sunday? And what had happened was I had gone and visited the Glendale Sixth Ward. The Glendale Sixth Ward. And I had shown up on the first Sunday of the month. So what's first Sunday of the month? Fasting and testimony meeting. Fasting and testimony meeting. And what had happened was on fasting and testimony, I mean, I don't know what it was like in the ward that you were in, and if, it probably differed from, from month to month, but um, people would get up, and they would go up front, sometimes be one of the missionaries or something like that, and they would give a testimony about how they know Joseph Smith is a prophet, and at the time, Spencer W. Kimball was a prophet, and uh, uh, little kids would come up front, and and they'd you know, get the microphone down to them, and they'd say, I love my mommy and my daddy, and I have a testimony that Joseph Smith is a prophet, amen, and everybody go, amen, and, and uh, so on and so forth. But when I was there, it got really quiet. And for quite some time, nobody did anything. We just all sat there. Well, it wasn't actually really quiet, because there's a lot of kids in there, and there's a lot of moving around, and it'd be very distracting for a lot of us. Um, but nobody did anything. And I remember as my wife and I walked out, she sort of looked at me and said, what are you thinking? She could just tell. And I said, well, they didn't say members only. And so a month later, I and uh, four other of my friends went back to the Glendale Sixth Ward. And I had memorized a whole list of scriptures on justification by faith. And so when it came to... When it came time for the testimonies, they said, anybody would like to have a, give a testimony? Come on up front. So I didn't want to be the first one up, so I waited until somebody gave their testimony. 
But then I got up. Well, it just so happened that right as I got up, somebody got up on the other side and beat me to the front. So I had to sit down next to the bishop while the other guy gave his testimony. And then I got up. And I got behind that pulpit. And I said, well, it's nice to be with you today. I would like to give uh, my testimony. I'd like to start off by saying that I am not a member of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints. I don't know how this happened, but even the little kids that were making noise shut up. <laughs> you could hear a pin drop in this room, okay? It was just like a collective, <gasps> everybody is just riveted. I mean, before that, you know, people are looking at bulletins and thumbing through hymnals and, you know, just daydreaming. And all of a sudden it's like, And so I had a captive audience. And so I started going through my verses because I wanted to, I wanted to, you know, bear witness to the word of God. I started going through my verses that I had memorized. I got about halfway through and this piece of paper flies over my shoulder and lands on the pulpit. And it's a folded up bulletin. This is so long ago. It's one of the, remember those old mimeograph machines that would make the copies that were blue? Remember those? That's what it was, Glendale, Sixth Ward, Glendale, Arizona, and scribbled on it is, Brother White, our time is up. Now, I knew how long they had gone the month before, and it was nowhere clear near that. So I knew I was getting the bums rush. So I finished up, and I went and sat down. Just, and you know how you know when the whole world is staring at you? I mean, every eye is just glued to you. Well, I went and sat down with my friends. And for some reason, all of a sudden, there were a bunch of people that wanted to give their testimony, and they were all aimed right toward me, right over there. They were giving their testimony. And once that was all done, then as they went to priesthood meetings after that, as the, the organ was still playing when the first counselor of the bishop is staying at the end of our row and said, the bishop would like to speak with you. And so we went into the bishop's office, all five of us, and we had a very interesting discussion with Bishop Stanley Buell. And uh, that's where I learned that uh, he was very offended that I had said that all men have sinned. Because he said, I've heard the prophet say he knows of some men who are perfect. It's like, oh, well, I guess I'll have to memorize a few more verses on the universal sinfulness of man. Uh, Wonderful. That's great. Um, But in our conversations, believe it or not, this is all coming to a point. In our conversations, one of the things he asked me, he said, how long have you been married? I said, well, about two years. Is your wife expecting? Uh, No, not yet. You see, singleness and no kids is not big in Mormonism. Because, you see, one of the reasons you get married, ever notice Mormon families tend to be a little bit on the large side? Well, the reason is not necessarily the reasons that sometimes we have large families. The reason is you've got literally billions of spirit children waiting to get bodies on earth. And if you are so selfish as to not help provide those those bodies, well, you're not being a real faithful follower of the Heavenly Father. And so being single, not a big thing. I mean, he was glad at least I was married and I was planning on having kids. But being single, mm, that's, that, that's, mm, Mormonism isn't big on, on singleness. What happens if you're a single Mormon? What happens if you're a Mormon who isn't married in the temple? You do everything else. You've, you've received your priesthood. You you've do everything else. But you are not sealed for time and eternity. What happens to you? Well... You can still go into celestial glory, but you know what you become? Well, l- let me ask. Do you know who, uh, who was Noah? Do you know? Gabriel. You become an angel. You become an angel. An- God's been an angel are all the same, same order of beings, just different levels of exaltation. But you become an angel because you were not sealed to your wife for time and eternity, and therefore, actually, if you were married but not in the temple, your marriage will not survive your death. And that means your wife can be sealed to someone else in eternity. 
That was one of the things that the early settlers really didn't like about the Mormons. Is basically what the Mormons were saying was, oh yeah? Well, if you don't become a Mormon, when you die, I might get to have your wife in eternity. That does not make you very friendly to people who have lots of guns back then. You know what I mean? And so, <laughs> you know, think about it. Mm, ah, okay, all right. But that's the perspective. So, the celestial level here has different levels to it and some would be gods some would be angels and um uh noah by the way i mentioned noah was uh became gabriel um you do know where noah built the ark north carolina the garden of eden was in missouri you all should have known that the Garden of Eden, according to Joseph Smith, was in Missouri. Uh, Noah built the ark in North Carolina and floated over to Ararat. But it started here on this continent. Okay, so that's where the gods come from. Then, for the rest of us then, we're judged by our works. Good people go to the trust your level glory. Adolf Hitler, uh, pimps. Genghis Khan, whatever, go to the celestial level. However, keep something in mind. Joseph Smith said that if for but a moment you could see the glory of the celestial kingdom, you would immediately commit suicide to get to it. That's how glorious the celestial kingdom is. So you can imagine what the celestial glory is like. Okay? So there is the eternal law of progression. Yes, sir. No, if you're if you're if you're a if you're a moral person, uh, you'll end up here in the terrestrial level. If you're really bad, you end up in the celestial. You're you're judged on the basis of your works, but you receive your physical body. Now, here's another place where the the language fails us. Everybody in the terrestrial and celestial level is damned. They're all damned. As in, damned up in their progression to godhood. They had the potential, but they've not lived up to that potential, and so they are damned up in their progression to godhood. See, so same same words, different lexicon. Eternal life, eternal lives, et cetera, et cetera. All right? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're going to get to that in a second. We'll get to that in a second. Now, I did mention... Notice this thin little line here from spirit prison down to hell and how Satan and the demons over here don't cross this line. The line specifically stops there, and that's on purpose. That's on purpose. Why? There is somewhat of a consolation prize for you, brother. Uh, We'll use, since you have identified yourself as one of the uh, sons of perdition, the former Mormon does get somewhat of a consolation prize. A lot of them are not aware of this, but evidently you are, given that your head was nodding. Um, The apostate Mormons are the only ones who come from spirit prison into hell. But they get their bodies back. Satan and the demons, and I'll explain where they came from when I apply all this to this world in in a moment. Satan and the demons don't get a physical body. They were cast out before the mortal probations. They don't get a physical body. And so our brother here will get to rule and reign over Satan and the demons in hell because he got farther in the law of eternal progression than Satan and the demons did. There you go. That's, where, that's why I emphasized where the line went here is that they get their body back Satan and the demons do not, and so they actually have a higher position because they progressed farther in the process, uh, and that's how that works. So, was this different for you? Um, well, I'm not a former Mormon, well, so... Well, no, they, they didn't generally like the term hell. They saw that as a Christian concept. Yeah. They preferred the use of outer darkness. So yeah, outer darkness, know. yeah. yeah. That's true. Okay. Now, let's apply this um, 
very, very quickly, we'll start to apply this to this world. What happens is God, the father of this world, is named Elohim. Elohim. What is Elohim? Well, Elohim is El, Elohim. Elohim, if it's used with a singular verb, is, just means God. If it's used with a plural verb, then it would be God's. But it's the, just a general, generic Hebrew word for God in the Old Testament, Elohim. Translated to Os in the Greek Septuagint or in the New Testament. Elohim was a man who lived on another planet. He was faithful on that planet. He was married to his spirit wives on that planet. He followed the four fundamentals of the gospel and continued to be into gospel rules and principles. And when he died, he was resurrected uh, along with his wives. Uh, And by the way, the resurrection of the woman is dependent upon the priesthood power of the husband. Uh, This is a very patriarchal system, uh, given polygamy and all the other aspects of it that uh, go along with it. A very patriarchal system. And he came and organized the earth. His firstborn spirit child in the preexistence is Jehovah, who is Jesus. So Elohim and Jehovah, and that's what I was throwing at you, Elohim and Jehovah are separate and distinct gods. Now, this is somewhat of a little bit more modern Mormon definition because you can demonstrate Joseph Smith really didn't believe this part, but there is a specific statement of the first presidency of the LDS church from the beginning of the 1900s that that lays all this out, so that's the official dogma as it exists in the church today. So Elohim and Jehovah are separate and distinct gods. One is the father of the other. Elohim has many other offspring. I have been told with confidence by some Mormons that God has at least 40 billion offspring. We haven't obviously gotten even half of them on earth yet. When it came time, when he had enough spiritual offspring born, it was time to start the process of the mortal existence and the law of eternal progression and all. A council of the gods was held, and in this council of the gods, which is Elohim and his offspring, Jesus, his firstborn spirit child, presented the Father's plan for this world. And basically, Jesus' plan was that salvation would be Arminian. The Mormon concept of free agency. That everyone would be given a free choice as to whether they would return back into the presence of God, whether they would become gods or not. It would all be up to us. But another of the mighty offspring of Elohim was named Lucifer. Now think about that moment. If both Lucifer and Jesus are the offspring of Elohim, What does that mean? Jesus and Lucifer are spirit brothers. All of us are the offspring of Elohim and one of his wives. So we are all spirit brothers of both Jesus and Lucifer. Yes. Was Lucifer the second oldest or whatever? I don't think that's necessarily been defined. I don't recall having heard that. But he was a powerful, preeminent uh, member of the child, of the offspring of Elohim. He presents the Calvinist view, <laughs> basically, not, not using that terminology, but he's going to force everyone to become a god. No free agency. A vote is taken. Elohim's plan as presented by Jesus is accepted. Lucifer becomes angry and convinces a third of God's spirit children to fight in rebellion against Elohim. They are cast out of heaven, and they become Satan and the demons, which is the line over here. And that's why they want to inhabit physical bodies, is to try to get back into the eternal law of progression. See? But they eventually are cast into outer darkness, but they never receive those physical bodies. And that's why 
our brother here gets to rule and reign over them. <laughs> okay, yes, sir. So the way Mormons would read the Gospels would be vastly different in terms of what Jesus is doing in exorcism. If they're trying to get back into some sort of... Well, they would see, they would see Jesus prohibiting them from doing that but yeah, the purpose of Satan and the demons and the nature of, this, of them as being, you know, offspring of God and so on and so forth would be completely different, yeah. They see the same kind of conflict, but it has a different origin. Okay? All right. Um, not done making application yet, but we're out of time. So we're going to need to take our break. We come back, we'll finish making application, and then talk about witnessing to Mormons, and we'll go from there.